Home sort of farm winery that that it started to be, and that's kind of what we want it to to remain in a way. Right. I think the higher end stuff will be smaller. Okay. How much? Uh, how many cases do you did you uh, make of this particular one? Um, of that one, we did um, we did three thousand gallons. So that's um, well. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we did, I guess, a, a thousand gallons, but I'm sorry. Um, so it's 447. I was just told 3,000 today, but I guess I'm wrong. So it's 447 cases of that particular one. Okay. So we did a little bit more this year. Um, we didn't do an 09. Um, so we're, and we haven't released the um, 2010 yet. So. So um, why, why did you not have an 09? Did you just felt that the grapes weren't of the right quality to, to produce this, and you used it, used it for other for the other ones? Yeah. We yeah we we um after going through after fermentations and stuff, we didn't feel like there was one that could be designated as a homestead riesling. So because we're a bigger winery, we have the luxury that we can do that. If we if there's years that it doesn't that doesn't make the grade, it's okay, and we can we can only put forth what we we deem is. Them the most like, the the best wine. Okay. So. And how long do you ferment this? Um, like for like how long is the fermentation or yes. how long? Is it been? Um, for that we we try to do um we try to do a, like a brick a day. So it kind of spans about like two weeks. Usually we'll we'll try to keep the fermentation like that. And sometimes it kind of does what it wants to, but we try to restrain it so that it it stays within a, about a brick um. Of, of sugar a day so that it goes down that much. Okay. So. And then, um, and then do you, uh, do you store it for, do you store it in stainless, stainless steel? Okay. I, I saw it something on here. It was like no oak. And yeah. You don't do any, um, you don't allow any malolactic. Yeah, no, we, and you even we, have yeah. your yeast on here. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, um, we, we keep it in stainless steel and we bottle it early so that we can keep that kind of fresh fruity, um, characteristics in there, and then it just bottle ages. So yeah, we we try to. Um, we've already around April May, I think, is normal time for bottling. Well, I definitely like this. Um, I mean, I, it's. I like all wine pretty much. It's pretty <laughs> rare. It's pretty rare I won't like a wine. Now, I had a wine a few, I guess, a couple weeks ago, that that got the uh, prices right. Boo horns or bat sad horns, but it wasn't very good. But um, yeah, this is this is definitely. I mean, I think you know these 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 two wines are you know I've I've really enjoyed them. I like this one. I like it because it is really nice and dry. Um, I like it for what this is. I like Davis for what his is. Um, you know, and and I, again, a recommendation. I mean, obviously, somebody down here in San Antonio is not going to be able to really go out and find it. But right. anyone in the New York area. You know, in, up in that up in New York State, if if you can find this, uh, and you're looking for something that's dry, then definitely get this. You know, and and I, I I really I really do like this. We do ship to other states as well, as long as um, we're. Able, I mean, there's some states that don't let us um, right. ship to there, but we do ship. So. Luckily, Texas is a state where you can ship. Uh, yeah. The only problem we have with Texas is if. You are, say, instead of a winemaker, you are a, uh, a retailer or a distributor. You are a retailer. Um, we wouldn't be able to get any of the wines in because of how all the legal stuff around the country and each state has its own little thing. But um, luckily, we are saying we wineries can send us wine, um, yeah. <laughs> which is great because you know what? 
to me, I should be able, if I want to buy this wine and I go to your website and I should be able to buy it, I shouldn't have to have someone have their, you know, have my hands tied behind my back and not be able to get it. Right. So, um, and I know every year they put these legislations in about trying to prevent this, but hopefully it will never, it will never pass. Um, what, um, so now, David was talking about the flatbread that they were pairing with, with his. Is there something that you guys were specifically pairing with this, or is it just kind of all general? I, I mean, I, I think Riesling's can pair well with so many different types of foods. I mean, especially the, the way, how dry it is. I mean, any sort of light meats, um, fish, um, even with some of the just little, like, this fruitiness in there. I mean, you can even pair with some spicy foods as well. So... I mean, I just think Riesling's pair well with so many things. I always feel like if you're if you're in doubt, just you compare a Riesling with anything. Right. <laughs> well, you know the 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 kind of I oh know I guess for me the, the kind of obvious uh, Asian food pairing, you know, would you know uh, I I, te I tend to like General Tso's chicken or or orange chicken, you know the the spicy type the the spicier type of stuff, um, and I can see putting this with that. Um, this is one of those wines where if I'm, I'm at one of those Chinese restaurants that has at least some wine and I've got uh, a Riesling that's going to be probably a little bit drier. But even like the sweeter stuff is going to be helpful with the spicy. Um, right. But this is like slightly spicy and it's not like going to put, put my mouth on fire. This is going to work well with that too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, I am going to move on to the Fox Run. Um, definitely keep the video going because uh, on Ustream everyone will be able to see what's going on. I'll be hanging out and um, uh, probably try to do some more tweeting now that I'm not like having to <laughs> do a lot of talking here. But, um, you know, this has been awesome. And this is actually the first time I've done the Ustream stuff. I don't know how successful it turned out um, as far as the audio part, but the video at least is working. And um, now that my, now that I changed my video, whoops, <laughs> now that I changed my video thing, I've covered everybody. There we go. Put that up there. Um, so this has been great. Um, how are, are there a lot of people over there? Um, yeah, there's um, there's there's about a dozen or so here. Um, I know a couple of the other wineries are doing it at their own wineries as well. So, so it's kind of exciting. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, this has been great. Um, I'm going to move on to the next wine. Uh, feel free to keep the camera going, and if anyone wants to pop in and say hi or ask me any questions or let me ask them questions, that'd be awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, folks. Um, we're going to go ahead and go over here to the Fox Run. Uh, like I said, I don't know if the audio is coming through on Ustream. Maybe somebody else in the house could tell me if it's working. Um Anyways, um, so we're going to do this. We're going to do the next one here. And um, this is the Fox Run Dry Riesling, also from the Finger Lakes. Oh, there's my little thing. Um, this is the 2009 vintage. So we've got uh, we two of the 2009s, uh, so the Red New and the Fox Run. And then we have the 2008 uh, Hazlitt. So we're going to make the 2009. This is also a dry. Now on the scale, we'll put this up here. On the scale, this was a, a little bit closer to medium dry than dry. So let's check this out. We're going to go ahead and do a little rinse on this. We're going to do a little tweeting on this. He's he's to 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 I said, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, so um, <laughs> dead air here. Uh, one thing uh, you probably already figured out by now that we had to have two recordings, and unfortunately, a lot of with Lauren was on, I missed a lot of it. Hi, David. 
And, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing yeah. standing here, trying to do some tweeting and not and, and talking at the same time. And I'm about to have the Fox Run. Um, what well, which uh, Fox Run wine do you have? I have their Dry Riesling from 2009. Okay. So I'm about to try so now we're just going ahead and try this Fox Run. I'll pour, we'll pour a little more in here. Let's right. try this Fox Run. Which one is fun? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this knows I really get the floral out of it. Uh, <laughs> as, as people who watch my show a lot, they, they, they know that I, I tend to struggle with white wines on the bouquet. But this is one of the ones that I really uh, can smell. It, it, it smells like I not necessarily literally walked out my front door and, and the flowers were over, but I can kind of smell more of the florals. And I, I, you know what, I kind of <laughs> a bit of that maybe orange or, or maybe even tangerine type of uh, so aroma off of it. Wow. if they went without this, Yeah. So it, 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 I know is closer to Hazlitt's wine. But. I think it's a little, a little, I don't know, maybe, I would call it, my, my opinion, be a little bit closer to medium dry than, than what it is, but, you know, this is all relative and it's all opinion, um, uh -huh. but, uh, you know, it's, it's got that dryness, the acid is a little bit more spread out, kind of like, kind of like your wine, where it was more spread out, um, but there's definitely, there's just not that, that sweetness, whereas the Hazlitt was really, like, right down the middle of, of, of the tongue, but, uh, Thanks, Sam. Thank you for the uh, get out of jail free card. <laughs> it's got a nice tartness to it. Um, kind of like a, almost like a like a like a lemon sweet tart. And, and I didn't get that kind. I mean, I got a tartness from Hazlitt, but I didn't get that sweet tart like lemon sweet tartness from it. This one's kind of got that that lemony sweet tart. I mean, if it, if it existed, or one of those like powdered type of uh, candy type of things, um, where there's a little bit of sweetness, but it's not like you know, it's not like a really sweet candy. Uh, I like it. I, I I think I like I like yours and, and the has it a little bit better, but it doesn't mean I don't like this. You know, it doesn't mean like it's it's bad. I I just you know, there's a preference. Yeah, actually, and the, those three wines that you have, those particular three wines, I think really represent a spectrum of style, um, both in terms of the, the choice of the, uh, like the product line, the choice of the particular bottle from each winery, but also the wineries um, themselves, their house style, if you will, or, or sub-regional style. Um, those Fox Run wines uh, tend to often have this real kind of laser-like acidity, but at the same time... Um, Focus. I guess when I think of those wines, I think the more focusing on a lime peel and some real fresh things like that. And I think maybe that sweet tart candy kind of impression that you have might be the same thing that I'm talking about when I talk about the, the lime peel and, right, and that exactly. crispness. Um, and I'm not sure. You know, one of the things we're trying to figure out, one of the things that happens when winemakers and vineyardists work together for a couple hundred years is they, they start to figure out what comes from the land, what comes from the winemaking, and everything sort of gels together. And we're, we're doing that at Finger Lakes, even though we've only been at making, really, vinifera wines for maybe 20 years. Right. Um, so we, we asked the question, um, how, how much does Peter Bell, the winemaker, influence that expression of style, and how much do the vineyards that he's working with influence that impression of style, or expression of style? So mm -hmm. but in any case, it's there. And, we, and I guess the... Where it comes from is a little bit academic, right. but it, it's a fun pursuit to try to figure that out. Right, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that just go, 
hey, do I like it? Tastes good. They don't. They're, they're not worried about, you know, what what kind of soil. What, what what's the soil and what's the yeast and what's the winemaker and what you know. They they just want to know does it taste good. And you know, I I know that I've had talks with people that that aren't really into wine too much, and they they really kind of ask me that question: Does the soil really matter? And I'm like, yes. And I try to explain it, but I'm not a winemaker. I, I read the books, but sometimes the books don't really explain it. At least the, the wine books that I read don't really explain that kind of thing to to me, where it may, even it makes sense. It's just kind of like it's it's loam soil. Like you should already know. <laughs> You know, you should know that loam soil does this or that shale does this. And, and so you have to kind of read between the lines when you're, it's kind of like uh, watching a reviewer or reading the reviewer. You kind of have to listen to what he says instead of like he says, it's an 89, you know. Okay, well, great, it's an 89, but is it an 89 that I like? You know? Or he may say it's a 78, but he may not like that kind of wine. Like, yeah, I don't really like sweet red, regular sweet red wines, and I tend to give them low scores. But it's a personal preference, you know, but somebody else might love it and go, well, Mark 79 or 78 is my 92. Very much. I'm glad you could join us out here. I'll stop by in another day or two and get some stuff. Yeah, we're streaming live. Streaming live. Streaming live. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's really, wine is so fun. And, you know, sort of connecting flavors and characters of wine with the earth is really fun. Um the whole question is so complex, though, in terms of the soil, the temperatures, the weather, the precipitation, the canopy management, the nutrition, everything that, um, even though it's tempting to kick the ground and say, oh, I got a lot of slate here, these wines are going to be really, have a lot of minerality. Right. Well, you do see those correlations in sort of locations and site in the wines, but the actual reason behind it is still pretty much a mystery, as much as any of, you, any of us think we have it figured out. When, when you start thinking you have it figured out, usually what you realize is there are 10 other factors you hadn't considered so you right. to keep going. And that's why, you know, where, where you do have, you know, especially as, as winemakers start learning what what they're doing. I know the Texas winemakers, they, they're they starting to figure out that maybe the, the usual Cabernet Sauvignons and Merlots are not the best grapes to grow in this area, at least in the hill country uh, uh -huh. or in some of the other areas in Texas, that maybe it's the Tempranillos, and I mean, not really Zinfandels, but the Tempranillos, and maybe some of the hybrids are the ones that really take to the the climate and the soils here versus the, the usual big uh, wines. Oh, you're tempting me some more. Look at that. That is beautiful. Everyone gained that sense of place of you know, and even as as you know, wine drinkers, you know, they'll they'll sit there and say, "This is definitely California, not just New World," or you know, "This is definitely Australia or Oregon or Finger Lakes or, or Texas." You know, as as they figure out, you know, what what works best in their areas and be able to take advantage of that. Yeah. Well, that's the real key is to learn about, to learn to understand your region and learn really what's appropriate. Appropriate is a complicated word in itself. But <laughs> figure out what really works and, you know, the, the goal is ultimately what's in the glass. And the winemaker's job is to take what's in the vineyard and, again, most appropriately and successfully interpret it in the glass. Mm -hmm. But what comes out of the vineyard is, oh, yeah, you're halfway through by then. You first, you have to figure out what grows best, and, and it's a long process. I mean, you plant a vineyard, it takes a few years to get the grapes, and it takes a few years to get mature grapes, and then it takes a few years to figure out what the wine does in the bottle. So it's it's, uh, it's not an overnight process. Right, it's not like something where, you know, next year you're going to buy a vineyard and you're just, you know, or you're going to plant a vineyard and you're going to have great wine in, in a year. It does take it does take time. You know, I, I've read it over and over, you know, people, unless you're going into something that's already been established if you're starting something you know from scratch it you know these 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 things take years not just a year or two to, to really get anything out of it that's usable you know it's, like you said it takes you a few years just even for the fines to get growing and then to produce good grapes where you know, i'm sure the first couple two three years that these vines are producing grapes are really not suitable for any wine mm -hmm. or you could make wine but it's not gonna be that good <laughs> yeah, well, it's the, the quality and characteristics certainly change. And uh, those young vineyards have a certain allure in terms of their characteristics, too. My experience is those, those first couple of vintages, particularly in, in a variety like Riesling, 
Um, they're not the ones that show the most depth of structure and complexity and, and uh, density on the palette. But at the same time, um, if you look at things like vibrancy of fruit and elect sort of electricity of flavor, mm -hmm. sometimes they have very strong assets in that in that area. So it's all about figuring out the assets and deficiencies of each individual vineyard and then how to how to interpret them and combine them in a way that works. Right. Now that you you touched upon something about about age of vines. With, with a lot of red wines, I mean, the, especially Zinfandel, they like to tout old vine, and even mm -hmm. though old vine doesn't really have a legal uh, yeah. meaning, but they'll talk about my, you know, the vines are 80 years old. Yeah. Is there anything yeah. with Riesling that having something that was, if there, if there was an 80-year-old vine, is that going to produce better grapes than, say, a 10-year-old or a 5-year-old uh, set, of, set of vines? Um, well, th there's a difference, and we're starting, you know, I'm starting to really pay attention to that as, as we get locked into really sort of consistent relationships with vineyards and with growers. Um, you know, I'm working with um, about 20 acres of fruit that's in the first or second crop this year, uh, this coming year, maybe third crop. Uh, but I'm also working with some vineyards that were planted in the late 70s, so that makes them, you know, 30, 35 years old. Um, and, you know, there, there's definitely a difference in fruit. Um, why? That's the big question. Why? Um, is it the age of the vine? There's a lot of things that happen as the vine gets older. They get bigger. They get more developed root systems. I think the physiology of the vine does does change in terms of its you know position in life. It's kind of like us. You know, mm -hmm. stop growing up and start growing out. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. It, it's pretty exciting to to look at those factors and 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 interpret them in glass. You know, the older vines. I think one of the big things is the whole water dynamic with an older vine is is different, especially here, where most of our water supply comes from the you know, from the ground up. Uh, very little irrigation in these vineyards. Probably essentially none in the Finger Lakes. Um, but I was talking about those relatively variable topsoils on top of shale, and that shale, there's water seeping out through the shale. So you know, what you're getting is groundwater seeping up into those vineyards as well as rainwater percolating down. So those older vines with very well-developed root systems have a very different sort of um, seasonal water dynamic than a young vine with roots only you know, a foot in the ground who are that rely largely on, on precipitation moisture. So that's just one of those factors that, a, the, a whole host of factors that may be impacting those differences. So yeah, those younger, those younger vines are struggling more to, to get that water um, because they're relying more on the rainwater rather than the older ones. They're kind of, they, not an unlimited supply, but they're not, they're not struggling as much. So, they're, so their grapes are gonna have a different type of character to them. Yeah, I think that that's a, certainly one of the factors, and that's that's something that I do I do describe to people when, uh, especially when they ask about you know dry states like Texas, uh, or even places like New Mexico and Arizona, and they they are surprised that you can actually grow grapes because you know 100 degree weather you're thinking well can you grow grapes I'm like yeah you can, um, you know, certain grapes aren't going to do well here, but other grapes will, as I'm shaking the table and the camera's moving around. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll even mention, you know, about Spain and the southern, you know, the middle part of Spain. It's it's as hot as it gets here in Texas, and, and they're growing great Tempranillo over there. That's why I think the people in Texas are starting to figure out maybe Tempranillo is, is our grape to grow rather than Cabernet or, or Merlot or even Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. All three of these wines have been awesome, and uh, this has been really great. I'm hoping to do more of this type of thing where, uh, whether it's it's getting winemakers involved or um, uh, getting other uh, wine enthusiasts or wine bloggers trying to do this multiple Skype thing, maybe I can get the, the kinks worked out a little bit better. Um, Especially when you get multiple, if you get multiple video feeds, I haven't figured out exactly how that works. I did a little experimentation last night because I have a second, I have a second Skype account, um, and it worked, but I didn't, but I wasn't really doing much with it. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's been really great to to talk with you and talk with Lauren. The other gentleman popping in, saying hi. <laughs> No, it's a friendly neighborhood here in the Finger Lakes. Exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, oh, this has been awesome, and 
I don't know which one I want to drink next. <laughs> I think I'm going to go for a little bit of sweetness here, uh, just because I've had a couple dry wines. And I think now I'll start actually just, instead of spitting, actually sipping a little bit more on the wine. <laughs> But I can tell you, after having the dry wines, there's that nice contrast with, with the red newt and, and the, the more sweetness to it. So, you know, I, I haven't been able to watch the Twitter stream much. What's been going on over there? You get a lot of. Have you been getting a lot of people um, uh, tweeting about the wines that they've been having? Oh yeah, the Twitter stream is on fire. Let me get into that. There we go. Of course, my video now just got really too big. Hold on, let's move this. Let's scrunch that up a little bit. That way, I can. I can look at the rest of my screen here and not uh, yeah, my video completely obliterate obliterate you there. Oh, definitely, there's a lot of people tweeting on this. Oh yeah. I'm gonna switch to the Twitter stream real quick. So, I mean, we can see there's lots of tweets going on, quite a few every minute. Um, there's a lot of people going on, uh, talking about what they're doing here. Uh, I got one viewer. <laughs> hey. It might be my viewer. on my laptop. It's all right. I'll have a lot more viewers of the actual uh, of the actual website. And now that the sun's going down, we'll get some. Lighten here. Oh, the switch is on the other side. There we go. Now we got some light, some extra light going on. There's the sun. Well, that's what it is. Adding my little tweet to the whole Twitter stream. Some nice little tweets here. So, see, this Lakewood, she's got four reasons to open the grill heating up and close on the line. Wait a minute. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I won't go any farther with that, but I'll retweet it. Uh, yeah, we actually have a. Let me, uh, let me make sure I follow Hazlitt. Yeah. 
So I want to see them in the I want to see them large and I want to see them because you know, I don't know if it's very small. So we have a really tight so how many how many of the wineries yeah. sent out wine for all this? Uh, I got three. Yeah, I would. Um, I'm going to say probably a dozen wineries or so. It, it coordinated with sending samples. I think through Finger Lakes Wine Country. Okay. Um, it was a uh, not everybody got. The, it wasn't a standard pack of three. It was sort of it's kind uh, of a random. And they got uh, a, a different tour. There are a number of different permutations that went out to people. So how close, uh, what part of Texas are you in, Mark? I'm in San Antonio, so that's the southern oh. central. Yeah, my uh, my brother-in-law's in, well, north, he's up in, uh, what town's he in? In the hill country, about an hour north or so. Like it. Right near Turnville. Fredericksburg. Yeah. I think you about half an hour from Fredericksburg, maybe twenty minutes. Okay. There's a and and, and one of the things that I, I'm planning on doing over the summer is visiting more of the Texas wineries. I I, I visited them uh, about a year or so ago, and uh, a, a few, but just how how my schedule was uh, wasn't wasn't really the best time to uh, try to visit a lot of wineries. Uh, but this year I hope to. Uh, I think in about a couple of weeks I have to see what my my day job schedule is. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm hoping to go up to the Austin area and uh, check out a few of their wineries over over a couple day period. I also have some friends up there I'd like to go see. Haven't seen them in a little while. But um, uh, that's that's one of my goals is to, to hit some more of the Texas wineries and and do video uh, do video work up there. Um, be able to sit down with some of the winemakers, talk about their talk about their vineyards. Not everybody. Uh, wants to be on camera, and that's cool. If they don't want to be on camera, that that's fine. I, I'll I just want to be able to go out and and um, and visit and experience more of the Texas wines because e even even the ones that I buy for for the show, I don't really get a lot of Texas wines. I'm I'm just I just kind of go through the aisle and just kind of pick and choose. A lot of times based on label. I mean, your label here would be something that I would be like, cool label. Let's buy it. I guess we'll have to send that some of that to Texas. You definitely should. Yeah. But I can tell you, you know, the uh, yeah. There's, uh, you know, quite a few. At least in my area, there's there's quite a few uh, wine shops or not wine shops, but wine, you know, large large and uh, wine liquor stores that uh, have some great selections. Uh, Specs, which is actually out of Houston, they've bought they've opened up a store here. Gabriel's is another. Uh, another uh, local chain. Uh, they they've got actually a, a big superstore in the north side of town, uh, but all their other Gabriels have uh, pretty good wine selections. There's another. There's a couple other ones called Twin Liquors. They're out of Austin. They're somewhat new to this area. And then there's another place called WB Liquors that um, is out of El Paso that's starting to come into town. I haven't really. I don't really know much about them. I just kind of saw that all of a sudden that they're opening up a store. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to go visit them and see how they're doing. And then there's, you know, there's other wine shops in, in town. There's a Cyclone Benny. They've got a, their wine shop is a house. It's an old house. And each of these rooms, you know, it, it, it's someone's home or was someone's home. And it's just filled with wine. Um, and it felt very bookstore-ish, like college bookstore type of uh, atmosphere that instead of books on the shelves, you have wines. And you know, I, I kind of felt that, that that kind of added to the whole. Each bottle of wine is his own story, and it was just very cool to walk around there um, and check out their wines. And there's a few other smaller shops that that, um, that I haven't been able to visit yet, but uh, there's a few other smaller shops that that uh, are around town. Yeah. Well, I'm out here in the middle of the tasting room in our crowd of uh, Riesling fanatics. Um, and my batteries, I, I just got my battery notice, so I'm probably going to have okay. to sign off pretty quick. But it's, uh, 
it's been uh, great having you join us here at Red Newt for the uh, Riesling Hour. Hey, I've been I've uh, really enjoyed having being on and having you and everybody else come on and just just having the wine sent. These the, all three of the wines have been wonderful. Um, I would recommend any of the three for anyone that want, that's looking for a Riesling, especially something that is different than what everybody else in America knows for Riesling. That's Washington State and Germany. Um, you know, this is something that if you can find New York wines, if you find these these Rieslings, get them because it's going to give you another perspective of Riesling that you're not going to get from the other states. Um, and just it's, it's a great expression of, of the grape. Yeah, and I would encourage anyone. Of course, I always encourage people when they uh, go into the wine shop to ask for our wine. Of course. Um, but, you know, Finger Lakes wineries are really expanding their production of Riesling in general, uh, Red New included, um, and starting to distribute in other states more and more. And the real key, to, the key question to ask your purveyor of fine wines wherever you live is, what Rieslings do you have from the Finger Lakes? Exactly. And hopefully, they, hopefully they have at least something. And if they say I don't have any, then ask them why. Mm -hmm. Because I'm mind. sure, I'm sure <laughs> that one of the big distributors in Texas or wherever state you're in has some way to get uh, get wine to that wine shop. And if it's mm -hmm. a good wine shop, they'll figure out a way to get the wine to you. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not the big distributors. I mean, there's lots of small distributors out there that that have you know. The smaller portfolios, you know, a good wine shop is going to figure out a way to at least, or at least going to try to get that wine to you, unless it's something that's just super obscure and, and is, is difficult to import into the United States or difficult to ship inside, you know, into into the U.S. for some reason. But uh -huh. you know, they should be able to get it. I mean, if I walked into if I walked into uh, Specs or Gabriel's and if they didn't have this, um, they which oh. actually I know they don't have any. Uh, well, actually, no. I think they may have a couple, a couple Finger Lake Rieslings, um, but if they didn't have it, they should be able to ask for it, and they should at least make an attempt for it. Mm -hmm. so, oh, this has been wonderful. Uh, you know, myself. Uh, it's probably time for me to uh, move on and actually get some dinner. Uh, maybe pair one of these up. It's you know, it's getting to be dinner time down here in San Antonio, seven thirty, and uh, uh, and and the. Uh, um, in the show here and then what I'll do is I'll end up compiling this it's going to be two different videos unfortunately when we had the whole big break I forgot to restart the recording about halfway into talking with Lauren so we got like the last part of all that and um, so I'll, comp I'll combine these two it'll be up on the site um, if it's not tomorrow it'll be next Friday I'll make it like a call a Friday conversation oh great I'll be watching for it we'll, awesome. uh, for the word awesome because if nothing else uh, at least on on this side with uh, with Skype, I have a program that allows me to record the actual call, and um, whereas Ustream, I'm not really sure how it came out, but uh, um, as soon as I get off with all this, I'm going to go ahead and look at the Ustream recording, because I did tell it to record so I can at least look at it later and decide whether I should keep it up or not. All right. So, uh, uh, David, it's been great. Everybody else, um, we're going to go ahead and end the show. Uh, as always, thanks for everyone for stopping in and having this live look. Uh, of some great Finger Lake wines, uh, Red Newt and Hazlitt, and then Fox Run. And if you can find these in your local shop, please check them out, or any of the Finger Lake wines, uh, not just these three. And if you don't have any of them in your area, ask them why. Where are they? See if they can get them for you. And uh, that's going to do it for the show. All right. Thanks, Mark. It's been great. Thank you very much. It's been, been a pleasure. All right. Good night. All right. Good night.